Please open your Bibles with me today to Isaiah chapter 9. We'll be on page 971. Isaiah chapter 9 will be our Advent chapter this season. And we'll be examining this. So let's rise as we read today the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 9. The prophet writes, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing their plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in the battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. May God bless this word today to you. Please have a seat. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander, darkling in the eternal space. Rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation. And all hearts were chilled in a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of the crowned kings, and the huts, the habitations in which all do dwell, were burnt for beacons, and cities were consumed. This, in case you think I've gone crazy, is the opening passage to Lord Byron's 1816 poem, Darkness, call, often called the most famous poem on the subject of darkness ever written. And in this poem, Lord Byron imagines what would happen one day if the light went out in the sky. The sun, the moon, the stars, everything went out and darkness was cast upon the earth forever. And he writes here in this poem of people who looked futilely at the sky every day, hoping that this would bring sunlight as the day came up and it didn't. He wrote of people who would burn their cities down just to have hours of warmth and light before that too went out. And then he wrote of them waging war in the dying flames. And then he wrote after the wars would come famine, and after the famine, the dark and bitterly cold earth would end in silence forever. He was having an upbeat year, that Lord Byron. <laughs> Actually, 1816 was a notable year. There's a real reason why he wrote this, because that was the year, historians know, that Europe had no summer. The year of no summer, they called it. What had happened is that there was this odd weather phenomenon. They had no idea what was going on. Halfway across the world in Indonesia, some volcanoes were throwing up so much dust and ash into the atmosphere that it actually started to darken the whole planet. And so they woke up and the skies were just darker and they weren't getting the heat that they, they thought they were. They had no explanation for that. And so many people during the year 1816 thought, this, thought in their mind that maybe things are just going to get darker and darker and darker until it all ends. And so Lord Byron wrote this poem to kind of capitalize on that thought. Well, as we go to Isaiah here, we look at the most famous prophecy of the coming Messiah.
I have to apologize because my wonderful son, Casey, got my notes for me this morning and decided it would be much better to just uh, apparently take out an entire page. <laughs> Fortunately, God gives us alternative means. Thank you, Casey. It's keeping me on my toes. We all need to know that. There we go. So as we well know, that there is a type of darkness that can settle over our lives. It's more than just visible darkness. It can be a spiritual darkness, but we know it's there just the same. It's the darkness of our own personal failures, the darkness of our sin, the darkness of our oncoming eternal damnation. And so as Lord Byron wrote these words, this is how Christmas begins. It doesn't begin with lights lightening up the tree or sugar plum fairies or even Christmas carols. Christmas begins in the deep dark. And that's how Isaiah starts chapter 9 here. It starts in this terrifying dark. And this is where we start our journey toward Advent. Well, as we examine Isaiah's prophecy this season, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that Old Testament prophecy often can have more than one thing in view at the same time. It can speak of two different things that are running parallel, one more immediate, one more long term. And that's what he's doing here. Chapter 9 describes the imminent threat in Isaiah's day of Judah being taken over, of Babylon coming in and just crushing the southern part of Israel. The northern part had already been conquered. And he's writing of this oncoming darkness that's going to be cast over the land. But at the same time, he's taking a longer-term view of the miasma of sin that has settled all across the human race since Adam and Eve's time and through all their descendants. This spiritual darkness that has settled upon all of us. So what I want to do today is I want to take a look at both of these. First of all, we'll look at the immediate context here, what's going on right here in Isaiah 9. The prophet Isaiah had the very unenviable task of delivering prophecy to a wicked king who didn't want to hear it. This wicked king was King Ahaz of Judah, and he was delivering this prophecy shortly before God would carry out the judgment of bringing Babylon to conquer this nation. And so Isaiah is saying, Ahaz, just like God took the Assyrians and he swept through the northern kingdom of Israel and he carted off all those people, the same thing will happen here. Your cities are about ready to be destroyed and raised and all of the people will either be killed, carted off into exile, or left destitute because they weren't important. And for the people who would survive this oncoming calamity, they would be left in a land that had nothing, a land of darkness. The power and oppression of Assyria and Babylon would reign for decades afterwards. They would think, they would have this feeling settled upon them that this just would never end. It would go on and on forever. And their survivors would be reduced to just walking around in rubble, in ash, in literal darkness at times, without much way of hope for the future. And for many of those people who, are, who survived or who were taken off into exile, they probably felt that their world, just like Lord Byron's poem, had come to an end. Well, living in darkness, spiritual or visual, isn't much in the way of living at all. Did you know that some prisons, some interrogators, will use darkness as a way to break the spirit of captives? They'll throw somebody in a dark cell and they'll just leave them there in pitch blackness for a long time. And it does things to your mind. It does terrible things. It breaks down your sense of self. You get vulnerable. You think that there could be an attack from any angle. You don't have a sense of where you are in space. And even the most proud person can be humbled to the point 
where they're vulnerable and they're pliable to change. And at that point, an interrogator will take them out and then start asking them all the questions they want. Well, even though God carried out the judgment that sent us and Ju Judah out into spiritual darkness, he doesn't do it to do that for us forever. Because often what he'll do is he will humble us to raise us back up again. And the darkness that, that Isaiah is talking of here is a humbling darkness. And we must always remember that even though God is carrying out this judgment, that God casts us out of the Garden of Eden, God cast Judah out of, out of that country, it was our acts, our sins, our choices that led us there. There is not one person in this world who does not know deep down that they are absolutely guilty before a holy God. Now, you might know the name of uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He's the guy who wrote the uh, Sherlock Holmes the mysteries. I don't know if you knew this about Doyle, but he was a bit of a practical joker. He loved to pull pranks. Does anybody have a practical joker friend? It makes you live in terror, doesn't it? You have somebody who just loves to pull pranks? Well, he liked to pull pranks, and one of his best pranks that he ever pulled was one day he sent out 12 telegrams. They're like text messages, kids. Ask your parents. He sent out 12 telegrams to 12 of his most famous fr friends, and he put on the telegram this short, cryptic phrase. He said, fly at once, all is discovered. And the next day, he found out that all 12 fled the country. Because no, he had no idea what was going on in their life, but he knew, that, as we know, that we're all guilty of something. We're all guilty, and if it's discovered, what will people think of us? What will God think of us? Well, God brought low the arrogant and the sinful to bring them back up again. And so, because he wants to bring us back up. God knows that only the humble can repent, so he helps us become humble. He knows only the people who see the need for a Savior will throw themselves on his mercy, so he opens our eyes to see that need, to see the depths of our sin. This is the origin of every person who has ever become a Christian, that we have once walked and been humbled in a land of darkness. That is our origin story. But what's really interesting, I don't know if you caught this when we were reading this passage this morning, even as he's talking about things like darkness and gloom, he opens up chapter 9 in a rather optimistic tone. He's talking about the enslavement of his entire country of the destruction of the temple. All these things that should send these people in tears forever. And yet there is a tone of optimism and hope running through these first few verses. Isaiah is telling us, God hasn't given up on us yet. And even though there is darkness, even though there is gloom, there is a moment where that gloom will recede. The darkness will recede. But through whom? How? Well, let's read on. Well, speaking of uh, famous authors, the author of Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson, as a kid, loved to watch lamplighters in action. This was back in the day where the streets were lined in gas lamps. And so every night, every evening, men would come along with their ladders and they would one by one go up to a light and they would climb up the ladder and they'd take off the top and they would light the gaslight one by one. And Robert Louis Stevenson said, as a kid, my face would just be against the window watching this every night. It was his television, I guess. He watched one by one as the darkness suddenly transformed into a shining row of lights. And one day, while he was watching this, his parents came in the room. And Robert turned around with just that glee on his face that little kids have when they're delighted by something. And he said, Mom, they're punching holes in the darkness. And I love that phrase, they're punching holes in the darkness. You can feel the same sort of excitement and enthusiasm that Robert had watching that as a kid. When we read the words of verse 2 here, that those living in this land of oppressive, smothering darkness that has no hope, has no future, has made them feel vulnerable and alone and afraid and terrified and paranoid, have now seen someone or something come along to punch a hole in the night. 
And he describes that against all hope, all odds, a light has dawned. This, is a, this has never happened before for all these people. In spiritual darkness, a light has never dawned. They don't know what to make of it. For the people who have known nothing but darkness, this mysterious light now transfixes their gaze. They can look at nothing else. They can't stop staring as it, as it cracks over the horizon, as it starts to push back against the gloom and against the darkness. It was strange, it was glorious, and it was fascinating. Like anybody who hears or sees something strange and unusual, there's this compelling need to go and find out what it is. Last year, when the garage right next door here, I don't know where I'm pointing at this point, next, next to Knox, the, the garage that burned down, that day that it happened, that was sending up plumes of fire and smoke, and I saw the crowds just come out. I was one of them. Because you see something like that happen, and there's this insatiable curiosity to, to go right toward it. Go toward the thing that's burning. That's, that's not great survival instincts. But we do it anyways. Because we want to know what happened. Are people hurt? What's the story here? How did it start? We got to know. So of course we as darkness dwellers here in Isaiah 9 are going to see this light and we're going to squint. And we're going to go, I got to know. I know people tell me not to walk toward the light, but I'm going to walk toward the light anyways. i got to find out what's happening, what's happening over the horizon. So let's walk together as we look here at verse 4. But take a moment to understand how unusual the structure Isaiah takes as he goes into this passage of the coming Messiah. The first five verses here of this prophecy are very limited. They're limited to people on the ground who have no greater knowledge of what's going on. They see phenomena, they report on it, but they don't understand the context of it. It's not explained to them. So they're describing a light, they're describing this receding darkness. And as Isaiah is laying out this gloomy scenario, he's doing it with people whose hearts are starting to lighten, that they know somehow that it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. But they don't know how. And they don't, he doesn't say here in these first few verses what this light is. Just that they've seen it. That's coming. That's pushing back against the dark. And now he says here in verse 4 that all those bound in darkness, bound by chains of sin and oppression, are being set free. Left and right, they hear the, the chains snapping. They hear the, the voices calling out in jubilation. And Isaiah writes it out of Galilee, out of the same part of the country that was just stomped flat by the Assyrians that had raised everything up there, burned everything down. He says, out of that region will come this light. One day, the light will dawn there. Well, we know that in a general sense that this light is from God. But in verse 5, the prophet, all through the verse 5, the prophet refuses to give us a specific explanation about who this light is. We don't have no description of it whatsoever. We don't know if it's a person, if it's a force, if it's God sending down His will. We don't know. Well, this is meant, as Isaiah is writing this, to drive our curiosity wild. We're given the results before we're given the effect, the cause. Who's doing the result? Well, we're told in verse 4 that this light, this agent of salvation, whatever it is, is sent down to do three things for the darkness dwellers. Three things. That it will break the, the yoke that is binding them to slavery. It will shatter the rod that was put across their shoulders as a sign of their submission of slavery. And it will absolutely destroy the rod that was used to beat people down. And again, two, two views here. You've got your, your physical and you have your spiritual, but both of them apply here. And from the people's perspective reading this, before the New Testament, when they were reading it in the Old Testament era, they're told that they have this coming liberation, that even as they walk right now in the darkness, in this gloom, that a light will dawn. A light is coming. And when it happens, when that light comes and they identify it, 
their oppression will be at an end. They will be set free. They will have this great liberation. And so that they can, at this point, even though they haven't been set free yet, they can start to rejoice over that. They know God's promises will come true. And so they begin to rejoice. But if the ancient Jews reading this knew anything, they would know that their debt of sin against God needed to be paid, had to be dealt with before they could be set free. They knew that God couldn't just hand wave away these crimes and still be a just God. And He is a just God. So they knew, well, if I'm going to be set free, and there's something to come that's going to set me free, then part of that being set free is that person or that agent or whatever it is needs to pay for my crimes. It needs to pay to redeem me. And so that they can start drawing these, putting these dots together and forming a conclusion before it's happened. The founder of IBM, a man named Tom Watson, once had a top junior executive come up to him and say, I have this great initiative that I want to take. Uh, I think it'll make the, the company tons of money. It'll put us forward. So Tom Watson gave him permission. And this executive put this plan into motion. $12 million plan to benefit the company. And it failed as hard as anything has ever failed in his life. Wasted $12 million right down the toilet. Did absolutely nothing for IBM. And when this happened, the executive went into Tom Watson's office and he offered his resignation. He said, well, I'm, I'm sure you want to kick me out of here. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And Tom Watson roared back at this man and says, I don't want your resignation. I just spent $12 million to educate you. Now get to work. Spent a lot of money to educate that guy far above and beyond. What has Jesus Christ paid to educate you, to redeem you? He has paid a far greater price to bring you out of your spiritual darkness, to forgive you, to give you a future where you can rejoice forever. If the beginning of Isaiah 9 does anything, it should remind us of how great our peril was, how astounding it was in our lives and in the greater scope of the church when the light did dawn. When something changed, fundamentally changed, that changed everything about what was going to be and now what will be. In these verses, we've moved from darkness to light, from gloom to glory. We don't know why. We don't know who. We're going to find out in the coming verses in the coming weeks. But right now, we know that we have been paid for and that it is time to get to work. This Advent season, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of people out there that don't know the gospel that are struggling with their own spiritual darkness, that are struggling with their own loss and their grief and loneliness, and we as the church can be agents to go out to bring them, not to be the light ourselves, but to bring them the light of Christ. God will give you a lot of opportunities, surprising opportunities to do this. Have our eyes be open. Get ready, because we're going to bring the light to those who have been living in darkness for a long time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for this prophecy. From us coming from it from a New Testament perspective, it's so obvious, it's so clear what it's describing. And Lord, we just thank you as you walk us once more through the story of our salvation, that we re recognize it started in humility, it started in darkness. And Lord, please help us never to return to that. Return to a point in our lives where we're too proud for you. We're too proud to come and confess our sins and to realize that oh, we always need you as our Savior. But Lord, we also thank you that you brought this light into our lives, that you cared for us, you loved us, you saw something in us that you loved, even though we often look at ourselves and we see nothing that we like. That Lord, we have worth because we have worth in your eyes. And you came down and you redeemed us with a great price. Lord, we praise you in your name. Amen. If you would like an elder to pray over you today after the service, please come up. We'd love to be able to do that for you. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace.
Go with God. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.